While you can say we're in the early days of customer advocacy, I think the concept is simply part of human nature, you know? Uh, customer advocacy is all about people sharing advice and what they like, other people being influenced by it. It matters because most people rely on other people for feedback, especially when they're still figuring things out. All righty, folks, welcome to another fantastic episode of the State of Customer Storytelling podcast. I'm Sam Shepler, and my guest today is Patricia Bautista, the Senior Customer Marketing Manager at none other than a company I'm sure you've heard of, Gong. Her mission um, is to really engage existing customers and also to uh, entice possible customers, prospective customers, through insightful, relevant storytelling. Um, one of um, Patricia's core beliefs is that customer communication uh, should be a two-way street and that as a customer marketer, it's essential to implement scalable, efficient marketing tools that make this possible. Previously, she also worked at uh, worked in customer marketing at Genesis as well as Automatic. Patricia, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam, for having me. It's It's my pleasure. And just to kick things off, Let's talk a little bit about customer advocacy. I know, you know, in many ways, you know, we're still in the kind of the early days of customer advocacy, but it's also it's also evolving very quickly. And you've been in the space for for you know quite some time now. In your opinion, you know, what is customer advocacy all about, and and why does it why does it matter? Well, Sam, while you can say we're in the early days of customer advocacy, I think the concept is simply part of human nature. You know. Uh, customer advocacy is all about people sharing advice and what they like, other people being influenced by it. It matters because most people rely on other people for feedback, especially when they're still figuring things out. I'm sure since the dawn of civilization, like folks have been walking into bazaars and marketplaces and have asked like a friendly face, like who sells the best chickens or meat or like magic carpets, right? And they get directed to someone whose businesses they appreciate a customer reference or referral, if you will. But in modern times, we simply have like an extended variety of channels in which customer advocacy can present itself. I mean, much of word of mouth marketing manifests itself online, right? Uh, Through one's company website, third party review sites, analyst reports, social channels, and a whole lot more. I mean, we try to influence and track these interactions with solutions like Influitive, Reference Edge, CrowdVocate, ambassador, but the fundamentals of customer advocacy are familiar to anyone who has ever consumed anything, right? So in my opinion, customer advocacy is not new. It's simply who we are as beings, you know, social creatures who share knowledge and influence each other's uh, transactions. I love that. And that's such a good example with the kind of the timeless marketplace analogy, right? And it's almost like, uh, you know, back in, in the, those days, it, it would, we also might look and say like, oh, who, which stall has the longest line, which is the most popular, right? Exactly. And now we're looking at like who has, you know, the, the best examples in, on their customers page or on their reviews page that are companies that look like, you know, our company and, and that we resonate with. And so that's such, that's a good, um, good example and a good, good metaphor. And we sort of hit on it a little bit, but where do customer stories and customer storytelling, where does that fit, in your opinion, in that um, you know, advocacy umbrella? So how does it fit under the customer advocacy umbrella? Um, I would say that customer stories are at the very heart of customer advocacy. You know, storytelling is powerful. It expresses a journey. Person encounters challenge, decides to find a solution, goes through their transformation, and they resolve it hopefully in a positive outcome, right? This is the core that threads itself through customer advocacy. I mean, at Gong, our customer stories by what we call our raving fans is really at the heart of our business, not just in customer marketing. I mean, customer stories help make our product better. Um, Customer stories convince people to get recruited by us. Uh, Customer stories don't just fit under the umbrella of customer advocacy. It's essential to everything. But to answer your question more practically, in the tech world, in our world of the internet, uh, the stories people paint kind of come out in the form of customer webinars, reviews, award programs, um, customer surveys. 
Stories are in most customer marketing programs or customer advocacy programs, really because these stories touch different parts of the life cycle, influence different parts of the life cycle, and um, are drawn from different parts of the life cycle. I love that you brought up two examples, making the product better and actually that, you know, helping with the recruiting that are really powerful, yeah. but, you know, maybe not the obvious things that we think about when, you know, a lot of customer stories, you know, the, the obvious use case is social proof, right? And, and customer evidence for, you know, sales enablement and, and marketing purposes. But yeah. tell us more about that. Tell me more about that. The, how have you guys also, you know, unlocked value around, you know, product and then of course, you know, recruiting. Yeah, of course. Anytime you capture a customer's story, let's say in a two minute testimonial video, right? The reality behind it is that you spend maybe 45 minutes, an hour, 30 minutes talking to the customer. And as you do these interviews, a lot of information comes out that we actually can share back to our product teams to help influence what kind of product they build. Or um, let's say the recruiting example, you know, happy customers and them sharing the stories make it a more compelling company to join. Because if you know a company is thriving, is successful, um, you're more likely to join that because it's an easier product to sell as well, right? So that it, that makes marketing easier. It makes recruiting easier. It makes, you know, being part of the product and engineering team easier. I mean, it infiltrates everything. Um, for example, if a customer or if a company has a lot of good stories or has been known to please their customers so that they raise their hands for these customer stories, then, you know, that even makes support easier because, you know, they, there are good feelings towards the company. And, um, you know, you're seen more as a partner than as just a solution provider. Yeah, it's it's so true. And I know, you know, for us, and, and I've heard similar things, and it, there's just like this swell of pride internally when, you, you know, the whole team and particularly you know, departments that might not always interact with the customers, like, you know, engineering or, or whatnot, like watches a customer story. And then, you know, especially with video, right? Like your example, because there's just so much emotion in video and hearing directly from the customer, oh, that that is like the impact and like this person's changed their life and their career and their career trajectory thanks to our solution. It's just such a, so much pride and uh, so great to see. So that's a, such a good point. Shifting to like, talk about like the strategy. So like if I'm a, a marketing leader, you know, and I want to do more with customer storytelling, um, I think we could all agree that it starts, everything starts with with a sound strategy. You know, in your opinion, how how should, you know, uh, marketing leaders think about, you know, setting that, that advocacy and that customer story strategy? You know, how do you think about that? How do you kind of go about that? And uh, when it comes to, you know, setting that that sound strategy that can be the foundation for success. Yeah. So if you want to do more customer advocacy as a marketing leader, always, always fall back into your primary business needs. Um, who's your audience for these stories, these acts of advocacy? What do we want them to do? How do we want to transform prospects' current way of thinking to you know, more positive outcomes, right? Even before you ask customers a single question, first ask yourself, what is my goal here in, you know, creating an advocacy program, creating new stories, right? Is it to introduce a new product or service? Is it so, so I can create relatable content to a new persona or market? Am I just building the foundation? So any story of a happy customer is good enough for me? Or like what kind of ROI or metrics should I share, if any? So going back to your purpose can help you outline your strategy. And the programmatic stuff happens later, depending on your resources, and can help you like decide your next steps. For example, uh, when I first joined Gong, I was the very first customer marketer in the whole company. And with customer stories that had been created early on were really very old. So the way I looked at it, is that I had to fulfill the main responsibilities or main priorities of the business, you know, let's say X, Y, and Z. And that merited like a full focus on creating full substantial case studies or customer success stories, as I like to call them. However, some folks wanted, you know, ABC, not just 
X, Y, Z, right? So it was a different level of priority for me, still important, but not as much. And so the solution there was to boost up our review sites to help fill those gaps in our customer stories. So basically, hey, we don't have a case study for that yet, but take a look at these five G2 reviews that can help address your prospects' objections or to address your need. So again, to wrap it up, like figure out what your business needs are, then ruthlessly prioritize projects that fulfill these needs. Again, the programmatic stuff happens later once you have this foundation. And communicate, communicate to the audience, which is your internal audience, uh, what these priorities are, and then keep on involving these prioritizations, um, but create workarounds as needed. That, yeah, that alignment with the priorities, such a simple, but you know, sometimes not easy thing to do it, but you're, that makes so much sense. So you mentioned the internal audience as well, which I think is a really good point. Cause like, you know, sometimes maybe depending on the situation, you know, priorities change, right. Uh, at the executive yeah. level. So how do you think about that? Especially for maybe like more, you know, when you were, you know, earlier in your career, how did you kind of navigate that? Did you have to be more proactive to actually, you know, figure out what those priorities were like up to the, up to the the day? I guess I'm just curious, how did you do that? And any tips that you have for, for other folks who, I think, especially, you know, earlier in, in your career, you may not, you know, be naturally as privy to like the shifting, constantly shifting strategic priorities, right? Yeah, yeah. So my suggestion here is really to find your allies. Like when I first started my customer marketing career, I was part of a global company that had field marketing managers in different continents, right? Um, so they knew what they wanted. And as the person who was in corporate, I was able to listen to them and um, decide on my key projects based on that, right? So again, you don't necessarily need to go for the top dog. <laughs> um, of course, you know, during during all hands calls, everyone should know what the company's vision and mission are, what the company's priorities are for uh, a year or a quarter, right? But if you don't have that direct feedback from leadership, go to the people on the ground who know what they want and who need their problems solved and just develop good relationships with them. You don't always have to go straight to the leaders. Of course, Gong being a startup and me being the first customer marketer at the company, I had easy access to leadership and opinions in that sense. But um, in larger organizations, you have to just adapt uh, with the internal resources you have. Got it. That that makes that makes a ton of sense. And um, I know one thing that you, you were talking in the pre-show about, you know, how uh, the role of surveys in sort of kickstarting a lot of the data that maybe leads to, you know, who to get testimonials from, who to get reviews from. Tell us about that. Like, how do you, how do surveys in, in just the mechanism of surveying the customers, how do you think about that? And how do you, you know, how does that fit into this, uh, your customer story strategy? Yeah, I mean, customer surveys are absolutely wonderful. Here at Gong, we use EcTech Validate, which is owned by SurveyMonkey, now known as Momentive. Uh, by the way, they're customer bars. But anyway, we use that to aggregate customer data to get customer quotes and to scale that up. And because of the tech validate tool, there's like a stamp of approval by the, the company to show that this is legitimate. We're not just um, making these up. But uh, this really allows us to come up with data that we can insert in, let's say, PMM slides in company decks, you know, by sending these customer surveys, we're able to kind of scale up uh, the type of testimonials we, we have. And uh, a really good thing about the tool as well, um, Tech Validate, is that at the end of the survey, um, there's a, tack, a question you can tack on, which says, would you be open to becoming a reference for our organization? And that could be for media or speaking engagements or reference calls or customer stories, right? So you, even though you're collecting data with the main goal of a survey, you're also able to gauge interest in other advocacy activities with customer surveys. Also, you know, this is a survey tool. There are other interesting ways that you can weave in customer marketing programs that actually have some type of survey. 
For example, uh, what we recently launched is something called the Golden Gong Awards. It's our second year of running it, but a nomination form for an award can be a survey to get stories, for example. Or, you know, technically when you fill up a review site question, that is also surveying what your ha a customer is happy about or disappointed about. And that's also data that you can use to eventually approach people for extensive stories or speaking engagements or other advocacy activities. That, that's, I love that. And that was the next question I was going to ask is sort of like any other tips on like identifying which, you know, customers to, to actually, you know, feature, right? And, and yeah. so it sounds like the, you know, of course the surveys, if they raise their hand, uh, mining your, your third party review sites for, for people who have been, um, you know, had a great experience. Um, what other tips uh, have you learned around actually that that identification process? Because I think that can be where people, especially uh, at larger stages where they have more customers, and yeah. at, that can be where they get stuck. Right? They they may know the strategic priority, and they they may have the goal, but then like, okay, great, like how do I actually figure out which customers to ask? Yeah. Actually, you touched on it a little bit. You know, I have several tips, but again, I want to reemphasize what you just said. Always ground the customers that you pick for success stories based on um, your business interests or rather your business priorities and needs. You know, will this person's story be useful for us? What kind of narrative will they present us? And what problem will be solved by capturing this person's story, right? So, you know, again, first tip is really to make sure that you're aligned to your business needs. Secondly, uh, we want to pick someone that is relatable um, to your desired audience. And this can really show your, itself in like different ways. You know, uh, you can prioritize customers, for example, with relevant logos because people like what they trust and sometimes they just trust recognizable brands. Or alternatively, they need to have good ROI or impressive metrics. When a prospect hears a good metric of improvement, they naturally ask themselves like, what if I came back to my company with this result? It's, it's appealing, right? And lastly, like pick a persona that resonates with your desired audience. Uh, it allows people, you know, the person consuming the content to see themselves in the person they're listening to, the person who did your success story. But really, uh, third tip is really to have a good awareness of your own internal resources to help you identify a good candidate. Uh, know what's in your back pocket. I break this down into several things. First of which is like internal relationships. I touched on this a little bit earlier, but for example, our customer marketing team is quite close to our customer success team, our CS team, and our sales team focused on growth. And, um, you know, given a business priority and a need for a case study, I use the expertise of our CSMs and reps to help find happy customers. And not only that, like charismatic or enthusiastic individuals, because, you know, as a company grows, you don't always have a pulse on who's like, you know, very engaging to deal with. But the rep or the CSM might know, you know, who do they find pleasure talking to, right? Uh, in talking to like this person, right? So first of all, work in your internal relationships, make sure I'm allies in different areas of the business. Next is look at your existing programs. I mean, um, aside from customer stories, there are other programs in customer marketing that can float up customer advocates. We have a revenue champions program at Gong. We have a reference program at Gong. But like I mentioned earlier, you know, you can also use other programs like customer surveys, customer events, um, communities to kind of help source folks for your customer stories. Lastly, I would say take a look at your tech stack. You know, you have a tool belt of different technologies in any sort of company. And what I tend to do is I look at our customer health scores on Gainsight and look at dashboards and size sense to get a picture of what is going on in a customer account. I look at NPS scores because um, we have an NPS score integration into our Slack channels. Um, so I know who loves us or not. And, you know, other reporting systems. And lastly, I have to say it, but um, this is why it's also awesome to work at Gong because we drink our own champagne. 
I'm able to go into Gong and see how engaged a customer is. I'm able to listen to business reviews within Gong and see like email velocity, who's engaged. And I study up also on who seems active and willing and a true raving fan. So yeah, use your relationships, use your existing programs, use your tech stack. That's that that's great. It's definitely it's really all of all of the above, right? That yeah. that makes a ton of sense. So so now that I've identified the customers that I, I want to feature, what about getting that agreement? You know, getting them in like, you know, getting them to to participate and sure. what have you learned about you know how to ask them so they say yes? Yeah. So for customer buy-in. I make sure to approach people who love us already and hopefully people with influence. Um, people have been known to be champions of our solution in the past. But, you know, again, like take a look at NPS scores, listen to those business reviews, kind of get the gauge of whether they love you or not. You know, a lot of times these champions, these in- champions in your customer base are willing to fight the good fight to make the story happen. It helps to appeal to how uh, the story helps them also appeal to their self-interest. For example, with Gong success stories, having case studies or videos puts the leader and their exciting vision into the spotlight, right? It shows their personal success, the accomplishments of their career goals, their team's goals. For example, um, if they were able to reduce their team's ramp time, you know, uh, resulting in X amount of dollars saved for the company. This is something they should be proud of. And we really want to emphasize that this story puts them in the pedestal. It's less of like, oh, talk about gong. It's more like, what are you proud of as an individual? And we want to really make sure that they're proud of that and willing to kind of share it back to their company because it makes them look good. But, um, you know, going back to the practicality of it, even before starting the process, we try to get permission um, from the legal or comms teams before, you know, even taking next steps. I mean, the last thing we want to do is put in a ton of effort of work and tons of work and find out that things can't get published. I mean, that's happened to me before in previous organizations and it doesn't feel good. But in general, like sometimes you have to pull out the big guns if you want support. Investigate the relationships of your senior leadership team uh, with key players in the customer's leadership team. Um, They can be very influential. Another thing is to perhaps get it in the contract. Once the customer signs up as uh, to be a business partner, or if a prospect moves into becoming a full-time customer, a lot of times negotiations take place. So sometimes it's a good time to weave in referenceability as part of the contract. So there are many different ways you can kind of examine it and um, take advantage of what's already in place. It's really good tips there. One that I don't hear a lot is is the, the leadership team relationship. Yeah, I think that is something that a lot of people forget that that's a that's a great you know kind of card to play, and that that is that is powerful. As you said, it's sometimes like surprisingly powerful, and people like to do help out people that they are friends with or have helped them out. So yeah, that is, that's such a good point. Yeah. uh, Going back to that, we had this like great um, story of like, I thought a success story had been shut down. You know, we got the no go for their, from their legal team um, late in the game because um, you know, natural uh, flows of the business, but then our CRO reached out to their, you know, co-founder or something. And then the co-founder was like, Hey, can we get this done? We love this company. And then boom, like, the doors were opened and we were able to get the success story out the gate, even though we thought that it had died on the vine, right? That's awesome. Yeah, it's there's always, you know, th- there's always a way when you can reach to the, the, the co-founder or the executive level. There always might just be a way to revive it. And that's that's such a good reminder. Yeah. You mentioned legal and any other best practices, because I think that's another thing that is, you know, a challenge for, for everyone, right? Is like getting the approval. Yeah. And can you tell, tell us more about that? And like, I think it's particularly around like what you, uh, you all have learned because I, I think that it can be like a blessing and a curse to like ask in advance in sometimes. Right. Yeah. Cause I, I think there's, there's the old like adage. It's like, uh, sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission, but you know, obviously like that can backfire just as easily. Yeah. Right. So like, how have you 
found that the sort of pre-approvals can work, even especially with companies, you know, medium and larger companies who the, the default answer is basically from the legal team, at least is like, no, no. You know what I mean? That's like, they're going to kind of start there. So I'm going to challenge things a little bit and ask customer marketers to reframe their way of thinking around it. You know, um, I would like to say that you should treat the pursuit of a case study like you're a salesperson trying to close a deal. You know, this is your opportunity to like multi-thread or speak to power, try to get multiple people to vouch for your cause, you know, um, instead of just having one champion in the company, what if there are other people that love you as much as, you know, your main contact, you know, have your base of allies within the customer organization, or maybe these folks can loop in someone with influence so they can get this story approved through their uh, own org. Another thing is like what I mentioned earlier, negotiate, um, you know, again, some of our most amazing customer success stories were actually negotiated early on, you know, uh, let's say pricing concessions or negotiations were happening during a renewal or a, f a new contract. Try to make sure it's in your sales process to weave in referenceability or at least the possibility of referenceability in the future. I mean, it's not ideal because of course you want them to pay full price, but if it's happening, if you know that there's a lot of like uh, negotiation going on, try to take advantage of it as a customer marketer and get it in early on. Um, again, they may not do the case study with you just yet, but it might be valuable eight months after the contract signed, right? Think ahead, right? And as I mentioned before, like use your connections to help influence the outcome. Again, sometimes it all it takes is a person with power in the customer organization to help influence the legal team and to make them more pleased with you. I would say if I had one other suggestion, it would be to be flexible, you know, if you have a really great case study and suddenly the legal team's like, meh, you know, the, you can go back to them and say, hey, what makes you feel uncomfortable about this? Is it a matter of changing the tone so that the challenge doesn't seem so challenging? Is it a matter of removing the stack? You know, it still sucks to remove your important, you know, metric. Yet, if the logo is good enough, it's worth it, right? So be flexible, make sure that um, you're on their side, you want to make them feel comfortable. Bend over backwards if you want something approved. Uh, a couple of things I want to you know, drill down into there, just the treating the pursuit of a case study like a salesperson. And like, it's like a, a deal that you need to close and such a key point. And, and you know, I actually come from, you know, well, I'm, as a, the founder and CEO, I've done a lot of sales. So I guess I could come from a sales background. It's like, when you when you get one no, it doesn't mean you you abandon the deal. You know, it's you figure out you know who, and, and really you're mapping all the different stakeholders. So yeah, that that's that's a, such a key point. And I I totally agree with you about you know if possible get negotiate it into the into the contract. I've actually noticed there's that is a interestingly sort of like divisive point in the sort of in the customer marketing community because I think it's sort of misunderstood. And my take on it is like because I I've heard some people say like don't make it contractual because like it's not about like holding your customers feet to the fire but i my thing is like well it, it's really more just preempting the conversation and it's like it's obviously pending satisfaction like of course. no one's gonna hold them accountable like to it if there's a case where like for whatever reason like they weren't thrilled it's like you're just unfortunately they got a discount and you're not going to collect on that case study but yeah if if you do, if they're happy, it just preempts the conversation. Is that the way you sort of look at it? Because I completely agree, but I've talked about that and I've gotten some pushback on that before. Yeah, I mean, it's just good to have it in the paperwork. It doesn't mean you're going to bully them into doing it. It's just like, for example, let's say they want a discount because you're getting more seats, right? You're not going to be like, right after the contract is signed, you're going to be like, give me a case study, right? First, you have to roll it out to people, right? This is just creating um, long-term relationships. And when the legal team surfaces after a case study has been agreed to, then you can say like, hey, this is what we committed to. Again, it's no pressure. And you have to make sure that it's, um, it's emphasized that this is just pending customer satisfaction. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So it's... It's uh, it's a bit more nuanced than like you know than sometimes it's made out to be and yeah great point. 
I want to talk about the different formats of, um, you know, of customer stories, right? In particular, the big three, you know, which I, I think are, you know, written case studies, third party reviews, and then, you know, customer video in, in various, you know, forms and length that we can loop, uh, we can kind of lump customer videos into one category. Yeah, Patricia, how do you think about the, those different kind of mediums of customer storytelling? Yeah, so you were talking about case studies, review sites, and um, customer videos or testimonial videos, right? Well, I mean, I love them all. I think they're what makes being a customer marketer so exciting. I mean, who doesn't want to listen to happy customers talk about how much they love your your company, right? It's it's energizing, right? Um, I believe it's the bread and butter of advocacy programs, right? Again, in like 2020, uh, I would say it's like, that was a huge focus for us at Gong, especially since I was the only customer marketer then. I orchestrated campaigns that brought in um, 1,500 plus reviews across G2, Captera, Trust Radius to strengthen Gong's competitive advantage. You know, this led us to earning the number one software product in G2. And I was able to like produce 33 um, videos and written customer success story pieces, including a series that focused on the pivot to the remote work environment, right? So basically I love them all, right? But let's be practical here. Like a lot of people consume information differently. People trust differently. Some people would prefer an industry analyst's assessment of customer happiness over review sites. Others like reading long form case studies that kind of give you the whole narrative Others will stop watching a customer success video after like 20 seconds, you know. As a customer marketer, you need to be able to cater to all these different ways of consuming storytelling. However, my advice is always to think about priorities, but also, um, you know, aside from the goals and the resources you have, always link it back to addressing the needs of your sales team and always picture these people as being real human beings that are relatable. You know, they're not stories. They are people who have achievements to share, right? And, um, you know, make sure that each of, you know, the big three align back to these things. That's, yes, such a good point. And I want to talk also about measurement as well. And I think your CMO, uh, Udi, uh, he has some really great points about that on LinkedIn. I'm sure you can share more about it, but I'd love to hear, yeah, how do you all at Gong and you yourself, you know, think about measuring or, you know, calculating the results of, you know, a customer story program to the extent that you, you feel the need to, you know, measure it. And I'm sure it depends on the channel, but yeah, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh- Really great question. One that is, I'm sure, on top of mind for most customer marketers. That's just a question that always pops up. You know, how do you measure the value of your customer story program, right? I mean, in the simplest, barest sense, you can count how many you're producing aligned to how what your business needs are. For example, if you want to move up market, you need to have three um, stories from up market companies, right? But there's a lot more nuance there that you can do. So one of the things about Gong is that uh, we drink our own champagne. I actually use trackers in Gong to know when the term case study is being mentioned by our sales team. So I get informed each time a salesperson shares a story in a presentation. So I use this for my own personal understanding of what's resonating or not, which stories are popular or not with a sales team. And I'm able to track the growth in the mentions of the term case study, for example. But as you mentioned, it really depends on the channel. Who is tracking what you decide to track? Like if I do a customer webinar, which is still a customer story, by the way, is it getting replayed? Did it touch white space accounts or growth opportunities? Are our existing customers rewatching it in our academy or community? What was, you know, what was registration like? What was um, attendance like? Or if I provide quotes or customer numbers from a survey tool, how can I get more eyeballs in it? Like, for example, we recently did new uh, product marketing use case decks. We made sure to include case study slides in it and customer stats from our customer surveys into it. Has this new messaging and their associated stories been adopted by this sales team? 
Or if you're in demand gen, you know, are you driving people to the review sites? What are the results? Are you creating banners with customers on them? What are the results there? Um, there's so many lenses that you have. And, you know, I'm totally against gating customer stories, which is, I know, huge for the, the digital space, but it's good to just get a like a pulse on whether your content is being used internally, externally. Is it being liked? Is it been shared? There's so many ways of doing it. It's it's endless, really. But I would say to any customer marketer out there, see what is important to your organization. Sometimes it's just like, look, we need five more stories on this topic and that's good enough for your org, right? Sometimes it's like, we need to help demand gen. So reorient yourself to that priority. So every organization is different, adjust accordingly. That's, yeah, great advice. And um, I think ties back to your earlier point about, yeah, the starting with the right strategy in place. Uh, so winding down here, just another thing I wanted to ask you about uh, is customer events. I know you've done a lot with customer events. What have you, I guess, what have you learned and, and how does that relate to all things customer storytelling? Yeah, so uh, it's been a wild ride since the pandemic. I mean, we started off with Zoom events that were very intimate, almost like little circles for customers to share their concerns, to vent about what's going on. And we used uh, breakout rooms to really kind of get into a more intimate audience. Our CSMs were our hosts in this room. And we really just wanted to scale up that support and that kind of like relationship in that sense. Now people are a bit more picky about the events that they go to. So we decided to scale up into more webinar formats, uh, which is a little bit more, uh, you know, like case studies. We bring in our revenue champions. We bring in customer speakers to share their stories at these events. And what has been really good about this as well is that we're able to create two pieces of content from this. For example, we have the webinar recording as a whole that gets watched from our, our community gong, gets watched from our education team's academy gong. But what we also try to do is do a write-up post-event. So let's say we have a customer that speaks at the event, talks about their achievements using gong. What we do is that we send this recording over to a writer who is able to make a whole case study that's two pages long, just based on the event. And that actually generates another piece of content that we can share out. So again, I invite you to look into making the most out of whatever programs you are already doing and to kind of link that back to customer stories to produce more. Such a good point. And how can we all as marketers, you know, extend the content that we have and take that and make it more extensible, you know, create additional micro content as, as well. We talked about how like customer advocacy is, is very much a timeless concept, but it's also one I think that, you know, is evolving very quickly and, you know, in exciting ways. And to some extent, you know, everything old is new again, and we're just getting new yeah. technology. But, uh, where do you see it going in the future? You know, what um, specifically with, you know, customer stories, what do you see changing, you know, over the next two, three years or so when as it pertains to, you know, B2B customer stories? Yeah. So the future of storytelling continues to evolve as our channels evolve, as behavior changes. Will I be using TikTok for customer stories? I have no clue. I'm not sure if I want to, <laughs> but I believe that as a whole, B2B customer storytelling or customer marketing is moving towards rawness and authenticity. I mean, there's a saying I heard recently from one of our gongsters, no one wants the corporate version of you. And the pandemic was so awful in so many different ways. But one thing I did appreciate was that people were more open to sharing their vulnerability, their quirkiness, their families, uh, their homes. Earlier in the pandemic, before we got to like slick remote filming, figure it out. I did a video series that showed how Gong was essential to remote work. And these were filmed on Zoom. They were grainy. We had some bloopers with like kids coming out to print stuff in their dad's office. Uh, we had delivery service come in midway. Of course, those were edited out, but that's 100% fine. I just think that there's room for us to bring that humanity back into our storytelling. B2C companies do this really well. We need to bring that back into B2B customer storytelling 
And I've made it my goal to make this happen more often at Gong. And I think we have had some pretty good starts um, with getting a true customer voice and giving that authenticity back. Mm, yeah, that, that's definitely something that's not going to change. Like we're only moving toward more of a, of a need for authenticity. And especially it'll be really interesting also maybe in the future, you know, video deep fakes, how is that going to be impacting things? Very that, right. That'll be, that'll be interesting. And, you know, maybe we'll all be watching our customer story videos in the metaverse and oh my gosh. Uh, we will see, we will see. Well, this has been uh, fantastic, Patricia. Where can people, you know, get in touch with you and Gong and connect if they want to, to learn more or just connect with you? Yeah. So feel free to add me on LinkedIn. And also please subscribe to the Gong LinkedIn page to watch or read our latest success stories and visit our website so you could admire our new branding. But really like feel free to reach out to me at any time. Amazing. And thanks for joining the show today. It's been a pleasure and we'll definitely have to do a round two sometime. Thank you, Sam. Awesome. Alrighty, folks. That's another episode of the State of Customer Storytelling podcast. Definitely, I encourage you to follow Gong on LinkedIn to see exactly what we've been talking about and connect with Patricia. Follow her. You're going to learn a ton. So much uh, that we could unpack uh, that episode, aligning with the priorities, You know, figuring out those priorities, those strategic priorities, and ruthlessly aligning your customer storytelling with that, finding allies internally, you know, leveraging your CS team, using your tech stack, using you know, your NPS scores, mining third-party reviews. We'll have it all in the show notes. And um, as always, this has been another episode of the State of Customer Storytelling. I'm Sam Shepler, and we hope to hear from you in the next episode.